Good morning, everybody. My name is Patrick Griffin, author with my beloved wife, Donna Lee, of Stories of Praise, which shows from the Bible how praise is a form of worship and also a spiritual weapon of war. And what I want to do this morning in collaboration with our good friend, Danny Contreras from Keys to Life, is provide a very brief survey of the scriptures to bring out the big picture story of the Bible. And the value of a study like this is not to provide extensive detailed understanding of any particular doctrine of the Bible, but to see how the scriptures connect with one another from Genesis through Revelation to provide that big picture framework and central reference so that when we open a Bible and we see all this information, we think, well, where do I start? How do I get my stake in the ground and start organizing all this information into a, a coherent picture? And we could say to somebody who comes to us with the question of, hey, I want to read the Bible and understand it. Uh, where's a good place to start? We might say, well, start with the Gospel of John or the book of Galatians or the book of Romans. And those are all good suggestions. But what I want to do today is look at the Bible overall and see how it connects up to give us that big picture. And I'd like to begin by reading with John chapter 5, verse 39, <clears throat> where Jesus is speaking to a group of religious leaders who are steeped in the Old Testament scriptures. They have immersed their minds for a lifetime in the reading of the scriptures, but they were missing the point. And this helps us to see that just because a person has a lot of knowledge of the scriptures doesn't mean he's not missing the point of some of the core components. So we need to know what really is the core message of the Bible that all the rest of the information is organized around. And Jesus simply provides us with that answer when he says to them, you search the scriptures. This is verse 39 of John chapter five. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. So here he's telling us that wherever you go in the scriptures, if you're not learning something in some way about Jesus Christ, we're missing the point. He goes down in that same passage to say in verse 46, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Now that's very interesting because Jesus is telling us that as far back as you can go in the Bible through the spirit-inspired writings of Moses, beginning with the book of Genesis, if we're not learning something in some way about Jesus Christ, we're missing the point. And it also helps us to see and not allow people to be misled into the deception that Moses is for one people group and Jesus of the New Testament is for a different people group. The whole Bible is for all people groups and the message is the same to all peoples. And that message is that the true followers of Moses are the disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to be compassionately, urgently insistent on emphasizing this as Christians, that the whole Bible is one message, one gospel. And we're gonna see that unpackaged as we go along. Now, just going back a couple pages, to Luke chapter 24, and this is where the Lord Jesus Christ showed himself on a road, a road to a city called Emmaus, where two of his disciples were walking after Jesus had been crucified. And the disciples were trying to make sense of all this. They thought that Jesus was the coming one of whom the Old Testament scriptures spoke, and they didn't have a good understanding though of the mission for which he came. So they're walking on the road to Emmaus and they're downcast because Jesus had been crucified and they didn't understand why this had to happen. And he falls in beside them and as he's talking, they're not recognizing him yet, but he says to them, and this is Luke 24, and we'll read, start with verses 25 through 27 where Jesus says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now let's really pay attention to this next verse. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures 
the things concerning himself. So there we have it again, that wherever we go in the writings of the law or the prophets, anywhere in the Old Testament scriptures, if we're not in some way learning something about Jesus Christ, we're missing the point. He is that reference for the whole Bible, and we're going to see how he is that framework for the whole Bible. Now, going on to later in that same chapter of Luke 24, verses 44 and 45, Jesus says to these same two disciples, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So there it is again. Wherever we go in the scriptures, we need to be searching for what we can learn about Jesus Christ because we're going to see how the big picture story of the Bible, as we go first of all through the Old Testament from Genesis through Malachi, is who this coming one will be and what God will accomplish in him for all who repent and believe and what this will mean for all who do not repent and believe. And as Christians, if we truly love people, along with the message of compassionate encouragement, we also compassionately need to emphasize the warnings of the Bible. You do not want to be numbered with those who have not repented and believe the gospel. The consequences are eternal and severe. So we've seen that Jesus himself has told us that wherever we go in the scriptures, if we're not learning something about him, then we're missing the point. Now, taking these observations and going to the book of Galatians, starting with chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is the Apostle Paul writing by inspiration and authority of the Spirit of God. He says something about the gospel that we need to keep in mind. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Very strong wording. And then he repeats himself. Verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Very strong wording. But the point I want to laser in on is he says that there is only one gospel. If anyone preaches any gospel other than the gospel preached by the apostles, let that person be accursed. Very strong wording. And then if we turn over to Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, we see another eye-opening verse that helps us see how the whole Bible packages one single message. Verse 8 of Galatians chapter 3 says that the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. Now, there's a lot in that verse that we could unpackage, but staying disciplined and focused on our point here of showing the big picture story of the Bible and how simple this really is. He says that the gospel, not a gospel, but the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. The same gospel preached by the apostles was preached also in the days of Abraham. Although Abraham would not have understood the gospel in the richness that we now understand it, it was preached through shadows and copies in the days of Abraham, the same gospel. And if we look over at Hebrews chapter 4, where it's referring to the Israelites in the wilderness after God, through the hand of Moses, led them out of Egypt, the scripture says, concerning these Israelites in the wilderness, in the days of Moses. He says in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 4, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, that is the Israelites in the wilderness. The same gospel preached among us was preached among the Israelites in the wilderness. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So the same message applies to us. We could hear the gospel all day long. We could repeat the sinner's prayer. We could take the water baptism. But if there's not a lifestyle that demonstrates a true repentance of heart that faith produces, 
then we are numbered with those who are in the wilderness who all died there, although they heard this gospel. So again, coming back to our main point here, the same gospel preached among the Israelites in the wilderness is the same gospel preached by the apostles, the same gospel that was preached in the days of Abraham. These, the gospel in former times was preached not in the clear, articulate way that it is now presented since the coming of Jesus and the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given, but through shadows and copies. For example, if you were to see my shadow moving on the wall, you, should, you could discern some things about me, about the shape, about the movements. But once the, the camera shifts to the real person, we no longer have need for the shadow. The shadow points in a rough way to the realities. And this is the whole message of the Old Testament in a nutshell. Who the coming one would be, what God would accomplish in him for all who repent and believe, and what this would mean for all who do not repent and, and believe. And what we're going to see is that each prophet was like a painter stepping up to put his spirit-inspired brushstroke on the emerging portrait of who this coming one would be and what it would mean for the world. So if we could turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and read some very important verses, verses 10 through 12, very important for helping to build our simplified understanding of the big picture story of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 reads... That's, again, 1 Peter 1, chapter 10 through 12. My eyes are struggling this morning. Okay. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So here the verse already is telling us that the salvation message preached in the gospel of Jesus Christ by the apostles and now continue to be preached among us today, that this gospel was prophesied about in the writings of the prophets before Christ. Verse 11, the prophets searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Now, I want to call attention in this verse to a couple important points that in all of the prophets before the birth of Jesus, the spirit of Christ was in those prophets and what was he speaking of? The things that are now openly proclaimed in our time, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. This is what the Old Testament prophets are all about in a nutshell. And verse 12, very important here. He says, to them, that is to the prophets of the times before the coming of Jesus and the giving of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So in the unpackaging of the mystery of God, the glory of the gospel from Genesis through Revelation, the angels are fascinated with the glory and majesty of this message. But here, this verse is telling us that the Old Testament prophets would search their own writings, trying to understand how these things are going to be fulfilled and when. And to them it was revealed that these things are for a future time. These things will be fulfilled in a future time, and that time is when? That time is now. Today, not tomorrow. Today, right now, is the day of salvation. Don't ever count on tomorrow. So, having read from 1 Peter chapter 1, that the message of all the prophets from the beginning was the, glory, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. The gospel, the big picture story of the Bible. If we could go back now to Romans chapter 10, in this very fascinating passage, it goes from verses 14 through 17, but I'm going to just read right here verse 16. Romans chapter 10, verse 16, where the scripture says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, here the apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is quoting from the prophet Isaiah seven centuries before Paul's time. And he says, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So I want to ask two questions. This pronoun our that Isaiah uses, who is that pronoun referring to? Obviously, that would be the prophets. 
Lord, who has believed our report? Isaiah is saying, who has believed our report? The report of the apostles, at least the apostles in the time of Isaiah, the prophets, not apostles, the prophets in the time of Isaiah. Comparing that with what we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, seeing how the Bible provides a commentary on itself very clearly, it, it is clear that the message of all the prophets was this report that Isaiah speaks of. Lord, who has believed our report? Our is a reference to the prophets. The report is the gospel. So here, once again, the message of all the prophets of Old Testament times from, from the very beginning to the very end was the gospel of Jesus Christ, which now in the New Testament is explained clearly in its eternal consequences, its eternal urgent meaning for us today. Jesus is that one who was promised to come. And God has accomplished in him everything the prophets said that he would. And we know what this means for all who repent and believe. We have the inheritance of eternal sonship, regardless of ethnicity, gender, social status. We who come to God through Jesus Christ in repentance and faith inherit the eternal reality of all the promises of God in the Bible. And for those who reject this message, who will not demonstrate true faith by a life of brokenness and repentance in seeking God's glory with our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, the consequences are an eternal shutout, an eternal exclusion from this favor and the consignment to an eternal condition of shame and damnation. This has to, if we really love people, we will not fail to warn them. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, God said, if you will not warn the ungodly to turn from their ways, their blood will be on your hands. Let's not come up short on this part of our message as Christians who love people, who urgently want them to know the truth. So we've looked very briefly at the big picture story of the Bible, and I want to just close by referring to some verses in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God promised a seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. The promise of a coming seed, the seed of the woman. And centuries later, God gave a promise to Abraham that he would have a seed in whom all nations will be blessed. And centuries after Abraham, we have a promise to David that he would have a seed in whom all nations would be blessed. So we see all throughout the Old Testament, the building of this suspense. Who is this coming one going to be? This promised seed who is referred to as the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. Well, when we turn to the first page of the New Testament, it tells us this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In Galatians chapter four, I believe it's verse five, refers to Jesus as one who was born of a woman. This coming one, this savior, he is this promised one, he has come. He doesn't come as a political philosophy. He doesn't come as an angel. He doesn't come as a rise in a level of cosmic consciousness. He comes flesh and blood from the womb of a virgin through the lineage of David, tracing back to Abraham. He is the second Adam. He's the son of God. He is what the Bible is all about. So that will conclude this very short message on the big picture story of the Bible. May God use it to edify and to exalt his name by Jesus Christ, his son, who's coming back quickly. God bless you all in the beautiful name of Jesus.